Great, thank you. Um, okay, so welcome. Um, we have some people in here that I don't think have been to a new developers meeting um, before. Um, we are very pleased to uh, invite Chris Burton today to talk about the new Bootstrap OPAC, because an overview of um, what that looks like as far as what we need to know to do our local customizations and everything like that. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and just turn it over to Chris. Hello. So um, the Bootstrap OPAC, uh, I, I shared the, it, first off, I sh shared the slides with Taryn so she can share them after. There's lots of links in here to follow after. Um, this is the bug listing for it. It was very collaborative. It took about 67 comments plus a few other collab branches and stuff like that to actually get it to run through. So um, what we wanted to do was just enhance the OPAC. Um, there's a number of reasons why, um, such as accessibility laws and stuff like that changing where we are. Um, so as of right now, it's actually rolled out into 3.6. So you can actually download 3.6 and enable it um, just where you enable your templates and it'll be ready to go for you. Um, any customization, any local customization will need to be um, probably reset uh, because just with the different structure, it might just not come through as you really want it to. Um, so the next step is for it to become default potentially as soon as 3.7. There are some blockers to it with some things that were added in 3.6 that didn't get looped into the Bootstrap OPAC. So hopefully those will just be resolved by 3.7 and this can actually become the default. Um, and we're talking about uh, depreciating the old template, but the date's still in contention. People still want it to be available because all the customizations are geared towards that one, right? So um, that one may take a little while longer to, um, to depreciate, but um, it'll still be there for the time being so that you don't have to like shift over immediately. The, uh, the goals for this was creating a design that allows ease of access uh, on any size device, providing an accessible site that allows everybody to have a seamless experience. We did have an accessibility speaker, I believe last conference. Um, and so adding that into this all just made sense, um, especially since um, we have, uh, Ontario has legislated the WCAG 2.0 AA standard as a requirement for January, 2021. So any website needs to be matching up to that. The US hasn't really fallen in line with that yet. There is like a monumental dominoes case if you've been seeing anything about that. Um, but uh, pending that, there's no real um, law forcing accessibility on websites. Um, but WebAIM here um, actually did a little bit of a survey of sites and kind of just crawled them, about a million sites, and 98.1% had an accessibility error on their homepage. Just their homepage, it wasn't even like, they had to go far to find anything. So um, we really could do better in trying to, you know, include everyone instead of just, you know, the visual look, because that's what we see. Um, there's a lot of different things to think about with accessibility. Uh, the bullet points here, um, there's using um, SR only, which is screen reader only tags to give voice to a screen reader where it needs a little bit more context without the visuals. Um, ARIA, which is another accessibility standard to help with um, labeling and uh, allowing screen readers to know that this is a button or this is a label or something like that to give the HTML more context. Um, also making um, contextual use. So like green meaning go, red meaning stop. I mean, it, it's pretty universal that that's what that means. So using that can overcome some language and some educational barriers where they might not know exactly what they're doing, but I mean, green means go ahead, red means stop. So 
Um, later on, I'll show you how I got the buttons to follow that and easier for you to adjust as well. Um, also, the, you, we um, added some icon iconography uh, with Font Awesome, um, which supersedes some language barriers, um, also educational barriers, because you can kind of get the context. A book means a book, you know, like in English, but not like everywhere else. It may be, you know, a different said differently in a different language, but you see an image of a book, you know, it's a book, like no matter where you are. So it gives you a better understanding without necessarily needing to know um, the language 100%. Using all text for images so that if they don't appear or a screen reader is reading it, it gives you that context that that visual aid is supposed to give you. Um, also header sequence, sequencing, that was a big one um, that ended up getting cleaned up in the OPAC as well. Um, headers need to sequence from H1 to H6 on the page. When screen readers end up building um, a table of contents for your page, it uses the header tags. And when the header tags are all jumbled around, it can be a little confusing for assistive dev devices and people that are using them to actually follow along. So you wanna make sure that they uh, are in order. Um, having enough contrast to stand out if colors are inverted or blended together. Um, so you wanna keep in mind colorblind. Um, even not being colorblind, sometimes things just mash together just while you're looking at them. So you wanna keep things, um, it's a five, four, one ratio. I haven't really, um, looked at if everything meets that, but um, everything seems pretty contrasted. Uh, keyboard tabbing as well. So if you're not using a mouse or you're using an assistive device other than a keyboard or mouse to navigate the site, then you can actually tab through everything and select it on the page. Um, tool tips were one that I initially made not accessible and then realized that they weren't havable. So making them um, an anchor tag or a button or something would really help uh, being able to tab into them. And the last thing um, is keeping text to a grade six to nine level to be more inclusive to anybody with a language or educational barrier and not require, you know, bigger words that that some people might not be familiar with, maybe keeping things simple so that everybody can understand. Um, these are bullet points from the WCAG 2.0 standard, which I uh, linked right here as well, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. They have um, what the actual standards are from W3. Uh, Right now we're hitting uh, 2.0 A, so there's a lot of um, stuff in here. So I kind of just brought it down to bullet points because that's uh, there's a lot of stuff in here and a lot of um, things that are over uh, AA. There's AAA as well, um, but some of that includes captioning and stuff like that that isn't really relevant unless you're putting up videos, which we kind of aren't. So. Um, what I used to make sure that um, things were accessible was the Wave Accessibility Evaluation Tool. This is a really neat tool that actually can show up in your um, in your toolbar here. Uh, and when you go to the page, you can actually just click on it. And if you see that there, it shows you how many uh, errors there are. It shows you what kind of features there are. Um, and how many ARIA labels you have in here as well, and what the heading structure is. It'll warn you of any errors. Um, this is a previous build of the OPAC as well. So, um, so it's pretty neat. Uh, it doesn't catch everything because it's just a programmatic check, but you can get the idea and kind of use that as uh, a helper for it. Um, also throwing the pages through um, markup validation really helps once they were complete, just to make sure that all the all the divs actually had an ending and um, 
there was no open tags left over. And I also linked here the ARIA specification as well um, for using ARIA labels. Uh, there's an introduction to ARIA here, uh, which shows you some of the problems that you face um, trying to make the site accessible, but it's not completely relevant. I mean, not completely um, explicit what that item is. You can note that the ARIA is labeled by something. Um, yeah, so take a look at that. Uh, that really helps keep things um, accessible in the long run. So some of the resources to keep it um, responsive were um, Bootstrap 4. I mean, that was the main one that was used in here. Um, there's a really good documentation hub here where you can pretty much search anything. It has information about the layouts, um, content components. Components is a lot of the things that you'll see throughout the OPAC, um, such as some alerts like this. It's The OPAC is fairly standard bootstrap for I'd, I'd like to preface it by not, by saying I'm not a designer, um, but I wanted to, to help bring some responsiveness and some ease of use uh, to the OPAC because as we started using it, when we came on board, we realized there was a lot of issues um, with using it, mostly on mobile. Um, one of my managers came to me just frustrated trying to like renew her holds on mobile and we knew we had to do something then to kind of alleviate that, which we did. Um, but this is taking it one step further. Some of the um, biggest <laughs> biggest asks was like the the some kind of date picker um, because a lot of the dates, especially the date of birth, the date of birth was weird because it was a different format date than all the other dates that were asked for. So um, it wasn't really very intuitive, but with the date picker, you can just set um, what the format is and how that comes out in the text box. So that it'll always come out that way. So you never have to worry about making sure that somebody's putting it in that way. Um, I mean, you still will, but in the, it, the error catching is still there. Um, but it'll do it automatically for you. Um, so some of the other things that you see in there, like Font Awesome, this uh, is free for um, number five, which we're using. So if you go to icons here, you can just search up whatever icons you wanna put in, like a book. And if it's, if it's one of these darker ones and not the grayed out ones, they're available in, in Font Awesome 5, which is open source and free. Um, so if you click on it here, it'll give you this little HTML that you can put in where you need to, um, to put in one of these icons. So it's really, it's really easy to do because you get, just got to search it up, click on this and add it to your code and it'll throw in a little icon for you. Um, so there's a couple other things, Popper JS, which we'll look at uh, later, um, which does your um, tool tips, which let me see if I can get in with a test user here. And once you're in the list. So if you hover over these little question marks, they'll actually pop up a little tooltip now. Whereas before they didn't really have much of a function, they, there wasn't even really text set to some of them. So they give you that option to hover over. And so there was um, a bit of an issue with um, beginning this because um, jQuery was being a bit of a pain. Um, 
come to realize that simple JS is actually using this function here um, that overrides the dollar sign function that jQuery actually runs off of. Um, so this simple JS function that was dollar sign s needed to be changed to something else. Uh, so I arbitrarily defined it to get s. And so now that's what it is for simple JS so that jQuery can still use its dollar sign function. So once that was resolved, we're off and running, everything was working. Um, and so some of the things that are used, um, we'll go through now. The bootstrap grid is a big uh, proponent of this. Um, so if you want to learn more about it, there's a link down here. What it does is it keeps everything to a row and keeps it in its, its portion. So, um, when you're looking at something like this, which is three columns here, if you reduce it down, it's going to become a vertical three columns because it's going to respond to the size change. And that's what we want to see. Um, that's what we want to see with the new OPAC is that on any device, it's actually going to run well. And this is what this actually really helps with that to keep things. If it's a bigger screen, filling out that screen, if it's a smaller screen, helping it out and keeping it vertical. So you can learn more about it down there. It's really easy to, um, to figure out. All it is is that, oh, that, that page froze a little bit. <laughs> so all it is is this container with a row in it, and then you put your um, divs in there with the column class and you can use different sizes. So um, for down here, it's like a six, it's out of 12 columns. So when you're saying six, you're saying you're gonna use 50% of the page. Um, if you're using five, it's a little bit less and so forth. Another thing was the bootstrap date picker. Um, it really helps to keep those dates standard and as you see in here, the, oh, let me go back here. So the date format just needs to be changed for each of them on what format they expect. And we can, all you'd have to do is click into date of birth and it pops right up and then it'll just fill it in to that predetermined format and it'll pass through the data as text as it expects and you won't have to really worry about um, warning users to put it in a certain way. Tool tips, um, as we've seen, just hovering or tabbing through, they'll pop up like this. Um, so if you're going to add them to a page that doesn't have them already, you will need a small script to enable the tooltips. Uh, decided to do this page by page because they're not used uh, gratuitously. They're very sparse. So just adding this to the pages that needed it made more sense than just enabling it globally. Um, and when you enable it globally, it tends to search for the tooltip anyways. Um, so I just didn't um, change to look for it before it runs the function. Um, so this just works on one page. Um, but all you have to do is add this uh, anchor tag. This I that's empty is actually the icon there. Um, and you can put the text in the title that you want to show on the tooltip. And you can actually use HTML in the tooltips as well. If you set this data 
dash HTML equals to Drew. And then that allows you to do some kind of spacing and whatnot as well, like breaking lines and stuff like that. Otherwise, it's just going to show up as a blob of text. So there is a couple of resources here. Um, one is the Bootstrap tooltips, which they're actually um, from. Chris, and I have a yeah. Uh, can you add links into the tooltips too, or not? Even though it's embedded in a link already. Um, I haven't actually tried because when you when you don't hover over it, it doesn't actually show up anymore. So. Um, so like if you went to click on the link, it would disappear anyways. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So it wouldn't really um, like unless unless you modified it for the late for the tooltip to stay open, the anchor tag wouldn't really um, do anything. But we you really could um, make it so that they stay open on click. Um, some of these actually, uh, I believe, work like that. There's a lot of options for these. Um, Bootstrap has a lot of options there as well. Like this one, if you click it, it will stay. So there are options for that as well. Um, yeah, so I, I'm sure you could put an anchor tag in, um, but you would just need to change it to stick there. Thanks. Um, no problem. And then um, I added uh, the popper JS website too, because that's where um, the bootstrap gets it from. Um, they use a lot of, um, they use this and jQuery as their dependencies. Um, this to fulfill the tool tips, which they actually are reducing the amount of dependencies they're using in the next version of bootstrap, which is kind of neat, so. There were also some custom solutions to fulfill some requirements, uh, such as minimize tables. The tables, when you go down to, uh, say, a mobile kind of view, the tables would get crunched and you'd have to scroll left for them. Um, they, they really didn't fit within the bounds of the page. And tables don't really, don't really work very well on mobile. Um, I did find a bit of code um, and modified it enough to help out. Um, so using the mini table class would achieve um, a table going down into something like this. Um, the only thing you would need to have on top of that is this um, in the media query uh, with the other tables. And what this does is it's actually pushing in the, the table header into before the table data. So, um, so it's actually appearing as some kind of header and it's showing as a header. It's not really though. Um, so this is, this is kind of a standby solution. I like to see a solution that works a little bit more dynamically than having to set each table header in the CSS. Um, but this does work for now with minimizing the tables and allowing them to be seen like this on mobile instead of a, lo a long horizontal scrolling kind of thing. So, um, with those two, what I did is use the SR only tag on um, a lot of these fields, because even while the table is is in horizontal here, and you can see what the title and the author and the format headings are, if a screen reader is reading it, it's reading all the table headers, and then it's reading each row. So it can get lost in context sometimes, whether the screen reader is on the title or the author or where, um, because it's just rattling off this list of items with no headings on it. So what I did is actually added these, um, 
SR only tags to each of the table data to actually give some context to the screen reader when it's reading it, that the, the title is this, the author is this, the format is this, to give them more context into what they're looking at instead of trying to read the table from top to bottom, because that doesn't really work when you're trying to keep it contextual. So there's been a bunch of other changes as well. Um, one of them being service alerts using the bootstrap alerts. This right now exists in the config.tt2 file. What you can do is just update the message here with HTML, anchor tags, whatever you need to. And um, it's built in with Bootstrap Zopac. So the defaults are success for green, info for blue, warning for yellow, and danger for red. So what we got here is the danger that shows up the red. Um, and then whatever maintenance message you have up there. Um, so what it looks like is like this. Uh, you can have some clickable link as well that you go to. It's also dismissible. Um, but it will come back unless you um, look into how to set the uh, set the cookie for that to keep it hidden once somebody closes it out. So, um, so that's just two lines in the config that you just need to update and uncomment when you need to put up an alert and just comment them out if there's no alert needed. I would like to see this actually go into library settings at some point so that anybody could really set an alert because sometimes there's things that happen like we've had like water main breaks or something that need to go up immediately. It'd be good to have more people have access to something like that um, with some sort of permission, obviously. Um, so some other things have changed um, in the in the summary of items, there is a more or less details button um, just to kind of contain some of the items, some of the details that a record has. This one isn't a lot, but some of them can get actually really, really lengthy and fill up a whole page before you could even get to the copy table and see if there's any available or do anything like that. And a lot of the information like the ISBN and stuff seems more like a librarian needs than an actual patron need. So what I've done is put most of it into the, um, the details here to show more hide. Um, so that way, when customers come onto the page, they don't have to fight through all the text to actually get to the listing or get to any of these additional content as well. Uh, also placing the, I don't think that's on this one, no. But uh, the language selection was placed into the footer as links. It was a lot easier access and switching than having to realize that you needed to go somewhere. Um, and putting it in the header took up some valuable space up top. So the footer seemed like a really good place to put it. It's on every page. You can kind of access it no matter what you're linked to and um, change the language from there. Uh, started putting in some dynamic changes. Uh, I wanted to see the, the OPAC get a bit more dynamic with um, changes than it is. A lot of clicking through took a lot of refreshes, and it just seems jarring sometimes. Um, so albeit how small this one is, it's just a small pay selected charges actually changes as you select which charges so that you get a running total down here so that you can actually see um, what you're, what you're, how much you're selecting to pay off or you could pay all charges still. Um, but just creating some, some dynamic movements in there just kind of brings it up to um, modern day uh, 
some of the screen refreshes and some of the some of the items seem like they could benefit from some dynamic changing and some of the bootstrap helps with that too like with the accordion um, hiding some of the summary notes it doesn't need a full refresh to show those notes so it's not really a big deal that they're hidden um, whereas if it took a full refresh it might be you know maybe we don't want to hide them because it takes a whole refresh to get back there um another small but big change was changing the back to results button to actually go back to your spot in the results so when we're searching up uh, this my story we can go back to the results to where we searched for harry and it's going to put us right back where we started with my story instead of starting us up way back at the top of the page just by using the id of the row that it was on just to keep it back right into so you can jump right back into the list because i know especially catalogers are like clicking in and out all the time and if you could just start right back to where you were in the list instead of going to the top and having to go to the bottom it's very valuable saving that time so um some color options uh, have been expanded. Um, so the facet colors and so there's there's separate colors there for the facets for um, when you're when you're searching um, these ones here. There's also um, contextual buttons added. So there's uh, button confirm would be your green, button deny would be your red. Um, and there's two other ones, button opaque and button action. So you can see them right here. Uh, so this is action and this is opaque. I kind of just named them what I was feeling at the time, I guess, but it's basically a, a primary and a secondary button for your opaque because there are times where you're using about six buttons in a row, especially in my list. Um, but keeping the red for like delete or go back or something like that um, made a lot of sense. So instead of having to change the buttons everywhere or um, or creating a new class and updating those in all the places, you can actually just change the colors of confirm and deny to keep them contextual, but also modifying it to colors that your library is comfortable with. Because I know everybody has their own branding and logos and stuff like that. So keeping it um, able to be modified really helps. Um, and these, these styles are just taken from uh, the bootstrap buttons. So they have the, the hover color on the border and um, just hoverable actions like uh, like this there where it gets a little bit lighter. So in the last about one or two months leading up to this, I realized there's a lot of functionality I wanted to change as well. It was mostly just a style update until a few months ago when it kind of kicked into gear where um, we wanted to add it to 3.6, and so wanted to make sure that um, there's a lot of uh, functionality improvements to it as well. Uh, so my OPAC got a whole um, overhaul uh, where you no longer have the My Account stuff up in the nav bar because that was actually expanding it a lot too and pushing all the content down on the page. So removing that and just going to my account you can see all of the um quick data that was up here before where you have um 715 in charges zero messages two items checked out and that's updated as well as having um the sub navigation there as well um the navigation was a real pain having links on top of links on top of links and it, it could get really confusing where to go. So having some kind of navigation structure like this really helps um, separate things and remove a lot of the complexity that wasn't really needed. 
Um, so the home is just the account summary charges has been separated out into its own page as well. Um, so that way we can keep this open for um, for library branding. I'm sure I'm going to end up using this to um, to promote some of my e-resources like cloud library, even though I have the titles in here, promoting that and Hoopla and all the all the great access that we have online, especially right now when everybody's stuck at home. So, so the navigation is a little, it, it's a little bit um, daunting at first, but um, this actually came from um, some of the navigation that was already there. And I kind of elaborated on it to keep it uh, dynamic where if eBooks was selected as, um, on for a library, they'd show up, and if they don't, they won't. Um, <coughs> and so this was part of what already existed. It's just largely expanded. So as you can see here, for something that's like messages, messages is just a button here. So that just is its own parent. Its URL is to messages which um, would show up here if I was in messages, right there. And then you have the text for um, the label, as well as the variable that brings in the number um, dynamically for each account there. And then after that, you'll have the name, which is the name that actually shows up um, up here. So um, just adding on to that, you can add um, extra labels as well um, for your pages. If you were to add pages, you would just bump up the, the children if you're going to put it as a child and one of the parents. And what I mean by that is this is the parents and these would be the children. So um, it holds four navigation items there so you would say four here and then you'd fill it in just like the other ones that are there um so another change was that there were multiple bases um set up for my opac now there is just one base um, there was a main base, a base, and a prep space. Uh, with the navigation being combined into one and having everything stem off of that, it only needed to have one base. So that's where you'll see this, and that's where you'll see um, just the like the frame for all of this. Also, another um, point of contention I've had since starting to use the OPAC was advanced searching. Advanced searching was very, very difficult to actually figure out, especially when you had a lot of selections, especially like when you're in the language tab, you have a lot of selections where you're trying to select multiples and you're not exactly sure and you have to, you're having to scroll up and down in that, that coded value selector that exists now. So uh, that still exists, but a new file was created for this check value selector, which actually changes all, all of it to checkboxes. And that allows both OPACs to exist, but this these checkboxes make it way easier for even non-accessible people to be able to choose um, by default, there's like a million languages in here. <laughs> uh, so trying to scroll through all of those and select the couple languages that you want could be really difficult, but with them laid out here, you can actually select them, see what you're selecting and review your selections before you actually hit that submit button. 
Um, so that was done for all of the listings so that you can actually just see them easier and select them easier and get to your search. Um, so not even that it was more accessible, it was just, it's less of a headache trying to do it that way than um, the way the multiple select list was working. So how do you turn this all on? Um, if you have 3.6, all you have to do is open the virtual host configuration in Apache and you just go to your templates area you're going to add templates-bootstrap. The only folder that's in there that it'll end up doing is OPAC. Everything else is standard. Um, and then followed by any local customizations, which you may need to adjust for the new template, but um, that's on a case by case, depending on how many customizations you have. So then you just need to restart Apache and it should take effect. So um, that being said, um, I know it's not perfect. I think it's a real leap forward. Um, so there's some things to do next, um, which there's some bootstrap blocker bugs for stuff that was added in 3.6 that didn't actually make it into um, the new template that just needs to be uh, adjusted to be accessible in the new template. Um, closing old bugs that this template satisfies as a solution. There's a lot of bugs that I was finding that are like looking for a date picker or something like that, that this actually satisfies. So there's a lot of old bugs that may be able to be closed on the OPAC. Uh, cleaning up the unused or necessary CSS styles. A lot of things were axed when, um, when the, Bootstrap was put in because Bootstrap takes care of a lot of it, um, but they weren't really cleaned up because they're still in use in the other OPAC. So um, didn't want to take them out right away, but uh, they could definitely be cleaned up in that template. And then um, modifying the OPAC alert to be set in the library settings. Like I said, I think there's emergencies that really this would be helpful. Um, reducing page loads on click, loading more content dynamically. Um, so there's there's some spots uh, like the serials, um, which when you click it reloads and then gives you the data. I'd like to see more of that come in dynamically so that it's a lot smoother of an experience. Um, and like I said, Bootstrap 5 is currently in alpha. If you want to check it out, there's a link here too. Um, there's no plans to update in the near future, but Bootstrap 5 does uh, remove a lot of the dependencies that Bootstrap 4 relies on, and it's like solely on itself. And there's a lot more features and overrideability and stuff like that to it as well. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty interesting feature. Um, I think this is really going to um, hopefully take off. Hopefully, hopefully a lot of people collaborate with this. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of collaboration with the initial projects um, since a few months ago, and uh, it's really helped for the better because there's a lot of things that I'm not seeing that, you know, you may not see that somebody else sees that even just their feedback is helping you get to a better point. So um, you can actually check it out on my test server here. It is a previous version, but it does have most of the options um, enabled as well. Um, another, another thing to note is that this is actually um, navigation in itself as well, the basic browse advanced search and the cart. So that'll actually show up on every page. Um, and that the cart was first being placed on pages separately. So I wanted to give a place for these things that should be on each page to, to be there. Um, but you can go check it out um, in the, yeah. So I think that's about it. I think I'm about done talking. 
Thanks, Chris. Uh, if anybody has any questions or anything, I'd be well, happy to field that as well. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been following it as you've got along, but I had no idea how much accessibility and improvement that you'd made. That's really, really cool. Yeah, there's a lot to it, but I mean, those um, validators really helped because I just finish a page and run it through and then do the adjustments and run it through again. I probably ran each page through like 10 times, but um, it really helps just catch things that I wasn't seeing. So, and like not a pro on accessibility either. I mean, it's, I've seen some, you know, webinars and stuff like that, but like putting it into practice, it's, it's kind of difficult because you have to have that perspective as well. You'd mentioned um, changing a lot of changing some of the terminology um, to be more user friendly. Um, does that, um, do you know anything about um, how many of those tags will need to be um, put into the translation files? Oh, I'm I'm not sure. I didn't change much much text at all. It's just like you want to think about keeping it to grade six to nine level, um, but um, there are some confusing things with the text too that you know one day it'll get worked out but that's a whole other book <laughs> anybody else have any questions or comments <laughs> i don't have any questions but i just want to say what an awesome job you did and how huge of a project that was. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. It uh, was quite an overhaul. I started it actually after the first conference I was at in 2018. And everybody kind of decided the OPAC needed an overhaul. That was like the most requested thing. <laughs> so I started it then and it's just coming out now. <laughs> so it's been a while. Yeah, and a lot more people are functioning through our websites now, so. Yeah. Yeah, so that's I, yeah, I mean, those files are mostly just HTML with a little bit of Perl sprinkled in, so. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it was a learning curve at first, but, uh, you know, once you figure them out, it's like, okay, this is how it works. It's fine. <laughs> awesome. I love it, Chris. Thanks. Yeah. I'm just glad it's out there now. <laughs> now people yeah, can use remember, it and put in all the bugs. <laughs> I remember when you first started work, working on it, and it was, I think it was a 2018 conference, and you had started it and had a demo part of it, and it looks whole 
a lot better than that first demo I remember seeing. Yeah, that was when I was just changing the style of what was already there. And then a few months ago when it just got decided it needed to go in like the next update, I just like started throwing everything out the window. But sometimes you have to throw everything out the window to make it work the way it should work. Yeah. Christina. Uh, <laughs> I was I was voting for the self check. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, a lot of what we have here is stuff that needs to be with the Bootstrap OCAC. It needs to be what is brought into self check. I mean, because the, there is um, we have to have those same things that happen in. Self check OPAT because it is a public facing um, entity. Now we're trying to also get all this accessibility into the web client, but that's a little slower than. The Angular surely helps because there's a uh... There's a lot more malleability to that than like Jojo that was in there. So yeah, I can't wait till Jojo's gone. Those last few things that are holding on. Well, and I think like what Lynn said, I think you have such a strong um, base here. I think as we do um, look at other public facing interfaces, like the self check that'll you know that gives us a really good example to build off of. Yeah. Yeah, they can be leveraged anywhere. Because I've used some of those tools before working in another with another library where we had to. We had to do so much accessibility on that one, and um, and yeah, running it through those tests. I, remember <laughs> once I, I had to do. I ran it through like twenty times to get all the. It's maddening sometimes. You're like, why oh, is it still there? And then you fix yeah. one, and it creates another one, and yeah. <laughs> and you go, why? Why didn't you? Why didn't you see that one to begin with? <laughs> Yeah. Well, we're almost up, uh, finished with our hour. Um, so I don't want to keep you guys too long unless you have more questions for Chris. Uh, our next meeting is scheduled for um, November 18. That's a Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And um, we don't have a topic yet. So if anybody has anything that they'd like to talk about themselves or that you'd like to see presented, um, you know, let me know and I, I'll, I can help track down a speaker and uh, bug people <laughs> to come talk to <laughs> um, Or we can work on uh, bugs or anything if anybody has anything that they're uh, working on that they want more eyes on. So um, feel free to reach out to me either on the new, new devs uh, email list or just directly to me. And, um, you again so much, Chris. That was really useful. Uh, we're we're planning on going to the Bootstrap OPAC in January with our annual upgrade, and uh, so I'll be probably diving into looking at it. Um, uh, next week is the Hackaway, um, so probably the week after. Um, and so, if I have, I'm sure I'll have questions for you once I get into it. <laughs> right on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll have it. I'll put it up. I'll do my customizations on um, a, a Terran test box as opposed to Terran master that has the the uh, Pines customizations on it, but with the concerto data. So log into that one. Oh.
Yeah, that's, that'll probably be easiest. Okay. Thanks so much. And yeah, I just confirmed that we just lost our, our license to record on the Google Meet. So that's why I can record. We were supposed to have it through the end of the month. <laughs> yeah. Just remember the Hackaway is next week. Hope everybody will see there. Um, we are going to have, I'm hoping to, to host a new dev, just a little meet, meet up somewhere sometime during the, the three days just to see. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> oh. so we'll have a, a new dev meet up sometime in the next, probably, probably Monday morning. I'm thinking about having it Monday morning so that we can have it um, and get all the new dev people out there and and um, get some of the other people that are not new devs in so you don't feel left out. Plus, I'm also pushing on the documentation that I'll be doing next week. 